Today I want us to read, um, I'm going to read um, 42 and 43 and put so we can put them together a little bit and we'll kind of back up and hit a real quick uh, summary because we've covered a lot of ground uh, in, these, in these messages and I don't want us to lose our way so, so we'll do that. But uh, Psalm 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with a throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep, calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your break breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And you notice the refrain each time, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, who is the help of my soul and my refuge. You see, we have to ask this question so we can begin to understand who is David talking to? Or who is the sons of Korah talking to here? Themselves. The writer's talking to himself. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? So he's saying to himself, why are you cast down? Why, why are you in despondency? Why are you in this spiritual depression, soul? Now you realize that you do talk to yourself. Do you know that? So a lot of people will say, well, I don't, I'm not one of those that talk to themselves. I'm not like that. Yes, you are. Of course you are. Now some people walk around and talk to themselves out loud. Some think it helped them. Others don't really know they're doing it. I was at a gas pump recently and a woman was walking down the street uh, on the sidewalk and she was talking out loud and there was nobody with her and it didn't sound like it was making a whole lot of sense but that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about how that our spirit our spirit communes with itself you, you know think about it. a lot of times you might walk out in the morning say it's raining and you look up and what do you do you don't say it with your mouth but in your heart you say it's raining or, oh no, it's raining again. Or, I, I needed to do such and such, and now I can't do that because it's raining. That's all going on in your head, isn't it? Who are you talking to? 
that you're talking to yourself. There is this constant conversation that's going on in our spirit. Now, and I think it's important that we understand that it's important that we govern that conversation. Because remember, we're sinners. If our sin nature is allowed to go by unchecked, you know what it's going to sit and talk to itself about? Wrong things. That's what was going on before the flood in the book of Genesis. God said the thoughts and intents of their hearts are on evil continually. So in other words, the, the internal conversation of the pre-flood civilization was a constant thought pattern of evil and violence and sin to the point that God said, I'm done. So God's reading our thoughts. God knows what's going on. But oftentimes we Christians are not much better in that we're not allowing our, we're not cultivating, and there's the right word, not allowing, that's passive. We're not cultivating the mind of Christ. We talked about it Sunday, didn't we? In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. We hear Paul say, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus in Philippians. We hear in another place in Philippians, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things... You see that? You, are, you and I are in control of our thoughts, or we should be. And there are times when you and I need to step in intentionally through the power of the Spirit of God and the Word of God and interrupt this conversation because it's going the wrong way. It's not an accident that if you look closely in these, in these two chapters, when he's taunted, where is your God? Which would be a point of crisis, wouldn't it? The next verse is, why are you cast down, O my soul? The very moment that unbelievers are looking at him and saying, where's your God? Why is he allowing this to happen to you? He's not agreeing with the taunters. He's not agreeing with the scorners and the unbelievers, is he? But he's debating himself. Why are you believing this? Why are you cast down? Why are you going along with those who are calling into question the faithfulness of your God? Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his book, Spiritual Depression, even says it, that sometimes we almost need to grab ourselves by the shirt and say, what are you doing? Are you going to believe God or not? That's what David's, or and I'm sorry, I keep wanting to say David. That's what the writer here say, is doing. He is challenging himself. He's looking himself, you might say, in the eye and saying, why are you cast down? Why are you behaving like this? He's not giving himself a pass. Oh, woe is me. They're right. God's abandoned me. God's mistreated me. I'm having this awful time and He's not doing that, is he? Now, he's clearly having spiritual depression, isn't he? And when you hit spiritual depression, you're going to feel justified to be in such a place. And rather than play the victim or enjoy the, the, the hole that we're in, this is the way we begin to deal with the cure. Remember we, last, last time we talked about... Uh, the, the causes of spiritual depression. We said some of the causes, we, there are more, but we said, you know, forced absence from the temple of God. We saw that in the passage. Uh, in other words, believers want to worship God, and when they are not allowed to gather with, unbelie I mean, with, with other believers and God's worship, it is a serious trial to them. Genuine believers are not looking for ways to get out of the gathering of the corporate worship of God. <laughs> Real believers are 
desirous to be with God's people. They want to be in God's people's presence, praising the Lord and learning about Him. Two, we saw taunts of unbelievers. We just talked about that, didn't we? Where's your God? We said memories of better days. He says, I remember the day when we used to do go worship the Lord. Memories of better days. They can be hard, can't they? The overwhelming trials of life. Sometimes life just punches you in the stomach and then it gives you a right cross and a knee and a, and a, and, and, and a headlock and, and kicks you when you fall to the ground. And it's wave after wave after wave. And you think, you're tempted to think, aren't you? Okay, where's the Lord? At what point am I going to be delivered? At what point is he going to stop this from happening to me? At what point will he have mercy on me and realize that I'm at the breaking point? Number five, we said failure of God to act quickly on our behalf. It's not failure of God. I really kind of regret that word. Uh, but you understand what I mean. God doesn't fail. But from our spiritually depressed viewpoint, if we're in this state, we feel like, why is God taking so long? Why hasn't he done something? It's not, it's not all out unbelief. It's not saying God doesn't exist. It's more like the disciples in the boat in the middle of the storm when Jesus was asleep. Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? I've prayed that. Lord, I'm going down. <laughs> if you're going to help me, you might want to do it now. You know, but we need to be careful because sometimes we're really praying that out of doubt and unbelief rather than mercy, pleading for mercy. Even our Lord said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Number six, personal temperament and physical conditions. We didn't talk much about that. Also, the effects of medication. You know, you need, we're a whole person, okay? You can be sick physically, and it can affect you spiritually. We have to understand that. You can be on medication that can affect you and your outlook. We have to address that realistically. We, you know, we're not talking about some kind of, you know, cultic way of, uh, of, you know, denying science or medication or anything like that. We need to understand God's made us a, a whole person, mind, body, and spirit. And when your body is sick, it's, it's going to affect your spirit. If you are worn down, you know, it, you look at the story of Elijah and you look at that, that, that account of him and the prophets of Baal and he, he goes up against the prophets of Baal and, and prays and God, God does this incredible display of his might and his, the reality that he's the true and the living God while the prophets of Baal are cutting themselves and singing and chanting and and all that, and they can't get so much as a spark uh, to come up. God burns the whole sacrifice, the, the wood, the water, everything, uh, through a short prayer. And then Elijah, having proven that God is the true God, takes the prophets of Baal, he literally puts them to death. What, for you and I, if we, it, it is a complete, or a, appears to be a complete victory. But what happens? Jezebel comes back and says, where is that prophet? I'll kill him. She wasn't intimidated. And Elijah took off and hid. Didn't he? And the Bible says that at one point, Elijah lays down the side of a tree and goes to sleep. And he wakes up, and an angel gives him something to eat, and he falls asleep. And he wakes up, and the angel gives him something to eat, and he falls asleep. And he wakes up, you know, and you think, 
what's going on? And then after that, it says that he went 40 days on the strength of that food. Was that special food? I mean, an angel prepared it. But is that the point? I don't really believe it is. I think what the Bible's showing us here is that Elijah w worked himself to death. Elijah was a guy that he goes 40 days after, he, what was he doing? Sleeping and eating, sleeping and eating. What was, his, what was his problem? Worn down. He was physically and spiritually exhausted. He had just had a showdown with the, the prophets of Baal and apparently won. But he didn't win, did he? Because Jezebel showed up and said, I'll kill you for this. So Israel still did not turn back to God. Jezebel was still in office. That sounds like a great place to plummet, doesn't it? Which brings us to one of the other ones, and that is a down reaction after a great blessing. A down reaction after a great blessing. Attacks of Satan, simple unbelief, a great disappointment, a personal failure, getting older, Guilt, whether it's real guilt or false guilt, all these can bring on spiritual depression. And if we're not handling them properly, that it can linger on for years and stifle our growth in the Lord, our effectiveness, our worship, our fruitfulness, all those things. And Satan, he can't steal your salvation, but he can render us ineffective. He can sideline us and make us be on the bench where we're not much good to God, ourselves, or anybody else. And if, that, if that's all he can do, he's glad to do that. And so we want to talk tonight about or begin our discussion on the cure. But be, before we get there, our last message on this, um, we'll, we will talk about the cure's for spiritual depression. Tonight, I want us to talk a little bit about false cures. False cures. Because Satan and our flesh is really good at getting us to seek uh, the, the, the healing we need from the wrong places. Okay? The first one is denial. Not denial river. But, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Denial, you know. We, uh, we can fool ourselves, can't we? That we're not, that there's nothing wrong. Everything's fine. We can get ourselves in some kind of place where we're not willing to deal with the unbelief or the sin or the guilt or whatever might be bringing it on. Some folks are in such a disbelief that they deny the existence of such problems now i've met people too that deny that you know depression oh you just need to get up you just need to stop it you know i think bob newhart even had a joke one time you know he would he the, in the in the video the the guy comes in and sits down and he 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 tells bob newhart you remember bob newhart everybody knows him okay he's um he's telling him his problem you know and bob he, he goes, he's paid his bill and everything, and Bob says, all right, you ready for the solution? You ready? Stop it. <laughs> just stop it. You can pay on your way out. You know, just stop it. Well, you know, that's funny, isn't it? Because the truth is, life's not that simple, is it? Uh, but there are some people that seem to think that the human psyche and the spiritual condition is that easily, easily dealt with. And it's not. It's not. Uh, and, if, and if some people have been blessed enough that maybe they've never dealt with these kinds of feelings or, or problems in their spiritual life, and so they don't, can't see how it's even possible that it exists. But it does exist. Some people did not experience denial by saying, oh, well, yes, lost people can experience spiritual depression, but not a Christian. And yet we've seen clearly in God's word that this can happen can it we can be we can suffer 
clearly just as badly, maybe sometimes even worse, than an unbeliever. So, and even when it strikes them, they refuse to admit that there is a problem with their Christian walk. So they continue on ruining their Christian witness as well as their lives and sometimes the lives of others because they refuse to allow the Spirit of God to use the Word of God to help them. This is not the Christian way. The Christian way is to deal with the sin and the problems, not to deny them. God's grace is sufficient for any sin or any problem that the Christian has. The Word of God is sufficient. The Spirit is sufficient. God's Word is sufficient for our safe and joyous direction through this life. Where is its joy and denial? Where is the joy in that? Christ clearly calls us to a spiritual, a deep and profound spiritual joy. There's no joy in denial. We all know, or if we're willing to admit, we, we know that all that's doing is just throwing dirt on it, isn't it? It's just covering it up. It's coming back. Um, so, denial. Escapism. Notice these, are, these tend to be ways that the world is trying to deal with it. Have you, are you noticing that? You say, well, Scott, those are psychological terms. They are. Because that's the way the world tells us to deal with the spiritual darkness, the spiritual doldrums. The world wants to deny them. They want to escape them, and so do we oftentimes. This is the most popular method to deal with this problem. And we're all guilty of it. We probably still are guilty of it at times. But we've definitely been guilty of it at, at difficult times in our lives, I'm sure. What do we mean by the term escapism? Uh, by this we mean entertainment, vacations, pills, or drugs, alcohol, sex, divorce. There's the one that's really the bad, uh, shopping. I had to put that one in there. That's just bad in so many ways. <laughs> well, we do have the term, don't we? Got to do some shopping therapy. Isn't that what it is? Or what, what, are, what am I? Do I have that right? Retail therapy. That's it. Yeah. What a foul term. <laughs> Lowe's is different. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's escapism. <laughs> You see the men, don't you? Just wandering around Lowe's. <laughs> it does. <laughs> well, you know, it's like Augustine said, God has given us all things to enjoy, but for his glory. See, there's the thing. You know, it's one thing to be walking with God and growing in God, and confessing our sins, and repenting of our sins, and growing in Christ, and to enjoy a gift, a vacation, entertainment, music, whatever. It's one thing to, to understand and take in God's creation in the way 